Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at FlexLogic with Andy Jarris. We're going to talk today about design and security obfuscation. Andy, we've been thinking for a long time about EFPGAs and security. What's taken so long? What's changed now? Well, I think there are a couple of things that have changed over the last few years. I mean, one of them was the big spectrum uh, breach that, that happened a few years ago. I got a lot of people thinking about how do they secure and add more secure features into their uh, silicon. Uh, so that's been a big driver. I think the other driver is, particularly with the advanced process nodes coming up, uh, it's taking a lot of time for and expense for people to build these big expensive ASICs uh, and deploy them out in the field. And now they're starting to say, okay, how do I secure them? There's much more hacking going on. There's much more software bad guys in the marketplace. Uh, trying to, to breach all types of different systems. So people are, are paying much more attention to security these days. And one of the issues that they're wrestling with all the time is that security is sort of a process. So you can identify one security threat, close that up, and three years later down the road, you may encounter a completely different type of security threat, right? So the FPGA can be programmed to be, be able to deal with this? Absolutely. Um, that's the beauty of having reconfigurable RTL, which is sometimes how we kind of brand it or, or reconfigurable computing, um, is to be able to go in and actually change the circuitry of the chip itself after it's been taped out. And it can be done in a secure environment before it gets deployed in a system or put in a system. It can be done at the system level, but more importantly, it can be done uh, once the system is deployed. Uh, you can kind of think of a satellite uh, if there's a uh, uh, it's pretty hard to go up there and change a chip or a board uh, up in space while it's going at you know 10,000 miles an hour. Uh, but if you download a security update, basically reflash the embedded FPGA with a new configuration bitstream, then you've got some new protection. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Andy, what are we looking at? So here is uh, kind of my rough drawing of a general SOC. You know, it's got your processor subsystem here. It's got a bunch of SRAM. It's got some kind of connectivity block. Um, there might be a transport uh, block on here. Uh, here's your peripheral subsystem to talk to, to, to the rest of the world. A lot, of com a lot of chips have DSPs these days, and then a lot of them also have a secure security subsystem inside of it as well to help uh, support a secure boot, kind of keep a watchdog on, uh, watch on uh, the overall chip management and what's taking place. One of the big concerns with uh, EFPGAs and FPGAs in general is that they take up a lot of room. So you think about the real estate that goes into a system, everybody's always been worried about, can we spare that extra millimeter of space? What's changed here? What is it now no longer a big issue? Or is Well, I think things are shifting a little bit. What I heard uh, from this last DAC and, and just a couple of months ago is that most of the chip starts these days are actually being done by system companies. So that kind of changes the dynamic from the traditional, the, the area question that well, most semiconductor companies are always worried about. But from a system company standpoint, you want to be able to build a chip. You're spending a lot of money, millions and millions of dollars for a chip, particularly an advanced node. And you want to get as much of a lifetime uh, uh, as you can out of that chip. So you want to build as much flexibility into it. System companies, because that ASIC, you know, if you build an embedded FPGA, it's no surprise it's going to take up area. Uh, but they're willing to make that investment in that area because they get a longer life. But also the cost of that actual silicon is just a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the overall system cost. So therefore, the impact on margins at the system level is really negligible. And these chips are also lasting longer than they did in the past too, right? So you think about an, uh, formerly when you had a, even a data center chip uh, running in a server, those typically would last four years. They're now looking to get seven, eight, sometimes even 10 years out of these, right? That's correct. And that's mainly because there's two things. It takes so long to tape out a new chip uh, and the costs associated with it. So there's, you know, there, there's a lot of more financial motivation to make the chip as flexible and be to make it upgradable um, over time. So you can't extend the lifetime of that, uh, of that actual design. A key strategy here has always been we can let the chip, everything else in the chip go. As long as we can reboot this and start all over again, it all should all be good. Is that still the strategy or, or has it gone beyond that? It's started to actually go beyond that because what we, you know, most companies that look at FPGAs, they basically reprogram it once, then they'll go through an iteration, a software upgrade, and then they'll go shut down the system, and reboot it up again. Um, but we've got some interesting technology where you can do that dynamic reconfiguration of the embedded FPGA. So now you don't have to shut it down for uh, data, crypt, data 
critical processing applications, you can reflash the, the embedded FPGA, so to speak, or reconfigure it um, with a new accelerator, maybe for a new workload. Uh, but now we're also getting into the point where we can dynamically do it in much shorter time frames than we, we can do with a traditional FPGA. Has the strategy changed in terms of what the EFPGA is used for here? So yes, you do have a security element here, but what else is it doing and how does it actually work with that security? So there's a couple of different areas. So what we're starting to see here is like a, a little bit of a FPGA fabric and the secure boot subsystem. And that does a couple of different things. One is it can brick the whole chip if it's not programmed correctly, right? And if you have a... Um, uh, encrypted bitstream, like um, using technology from Intrinsics ID, for example, where it's tied to the actual chip itself. Now you've got a one-to-one -one correlation of an encryption key to that particular chip. So if that encryption key doesn't work, then the FPGA here doesn't get programmed, and uh, the secure boot says, "Oh, this is a bad bitstream, uh, so we're not going to boot the chip, and it's dead." Uh, so we see that quite a bit are starting to come into play, and this doesn't require a lot of uh, embedded FPGA resources. So it's just a small amount of embedded FPGA, so it's really actually uh, well suited for commercial semiconductor companies and also system companies. But the other thing that we see is, in kind of take this away a little bit, but a lot of customers will have proprietary, um, they'll have their own proprietary cir circuitry that they don't want to share with anybody. It could be uh, a specific way that somebody encrypts or decrypts a video stream. It could be a communications protocol. It could be an, uh, a peripheral interface uh, that is customizable or, or proprietary to a particular system. And people may not want to share that because they don't want other people to clone their chips, for example, um, by creating a, another chip that plugs right into the system that might, uh, plugs into the bus of a system that might be proprietary. Um, so now they're starting to look at a little bit more larger amounts of embedded FPGA uh, to be able to really kind of protect their own uh, IP and intellectual property um, that would go on a chip. And that, and that gets programmed, of course, after manufacturing in a secure environment. How secure is the EFPGA itself? Well, the EFPGA itself is, you know, it's a block, but it's buried inside the chip. Um, with our particular technology, it is a volatile uh, memory cell or memory structure. So when it gets powered, you lose the contents, right? So um, you brick the chip or you do some other security measure to, to power down the embedded FPGA, uh, you lose all contents uh, and therefore protecting your technology. Another challenge here, and a lot of chip companies are facing this, is what works in one geography doesn't necessarily work in another. How do you deal with these kinds of things? How do you deal with export controls? How do you deal with uh, all the geopolitical stuff that's going on right now? Yeah, so I'll, I'll pick on the wireless uh, markets. So they have their own uh, encryption and decryption uh, algorithms for different uh, geographic regions, as you kind of uh, uh, mentioned. Yeah. When a semiconductor company has to, makes a chip specifically targeting each one of those regions, then they have to go through extensive export controls and export licenses to be able to sell that chip in different regions. Uh, moving any kind of encryption algorithm across the, the U.S. or different borders is always very, very touchy. But that can all be eliminated by putting that encryption algorithm within the embedded FPGA. Because then you just basically have a, a chip. It doesn't work in any particular region until you ship it in that region, and then you have it programmed in that region with that particular encryption algorithm. Andy Jaros, thanks for a great explanation. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ed.